really happy that you all were able to join us today. Before we get into uh, talking about uh, data observability at JetBlue, I just want to do a quick round of intros from us up here in the front. So my name is Ashley Van Name. I'm the Senior Manager of Data Engineering at JetBlue. Um, I've been with the company for just about six years, started there as a data analyst, working day in and day out, writing SQL queries, building reports. And then I kind of moved over into the engineering world when the opportunity presented itself. And I've been now leading the team um, uh, that con it consists of really two, f well, three focus areas, one being our Snowflake data warehouse. So building pipelines into and out of it. The other arm of it being the operational data store that powers our internal and external facing application. So our mobile app, our website, all the data that flows in there, the, the team uh, works day in and day out on that. And then we also have an operations team, which is a subset of the data engineering team, which you'll hear more about today when we get into operationalizing observability overall. Um, and I'm going to pass it over to Brian to do his intro as well. Hey, folks. Um, so my name is Brian Peterson. Um, I am our manager of data products at JetBlue. I roll in under Ashley and under our engineering wing. Um, I've been at JetBlue since April of 2018. I'm not a math guy, whatever that amounts to. And I, uh, in my in my role as our uh, manager of data products, I'm essentially responsible for the analyst experience using Snowflake, the data that we have inside of it, how they query it, how it's structured. Um, and then another component of my role is um, being the primary owner of our instance of Monte Carlo, which is our data observability platform and what we're going to be talking with you all about today. So on that note, um, <clears throat> what we're going to run through is <laughs> essentially like the importance of our ability to have uh, fast and reliable data uh, here at JetBlue. Um, we'll do a quick um, overview of our architecture and talk about some of our observability use cases in Monte Carlo and then some kind of wrap up and lessons learned. So starting with our landscape, just to give you all an idea, we've been on, uh, started on our Snowflake journey in uh, 2019 and really wrapped it around the beginning of 2021. But we've got about 3,400 uh, analyst facing tables and views. All of those are monitored by Monte Carlo, about five petabytes of data, about 400 monthly active users. And interestingly, I didn't actually have this number until this presentation, but around 50, 52,000 qu queries a week run by Monte Carlo on our instance. So the past several years, and really, um, even if you've been flying uh, this week, um, have been a very valuable learning experience for airlines. And our, like I explained earlier, our monitor data stack journey began in around 2021. And we essentially just noticed after getting out of that platform that we had more throughput, we had more capacity. Um, so we started to bring on more data sets. More data sets means for more people using your data, more people using your data means more scrutinizing and more attention on that data, right? So around 2021, we decided that we really needed an observability platform. Um, the need for this uh, focus area just became more and more um, prevalent. So on top of that, just ex increased exposure and increased visibility and increased scrutiny on our data, we have a general uh, sentiment survey that we sent out to our users every year. And we just noticed that the question that we asked around trust in our data um, had a score that was a little bit lower than what we wanted uh, it to be. On top of that, AI has been really the <laughs> um, obsession point for all of us, um, certainly this week, but this year. And the past six to 12 months, um, JetBlue has really scaled up and doubled down on our, on our AI strategy. And any of you um, who have embarked on that same journey know that if you don't have quality data going into those AI tools, you're going to get imperfect recommendations or imperfect predictions out of them, right? So just again, the need for observability really tied in not only to what we were seeing in our user sentiment surveys, but also just our overall data strategy. So it became part of our data strategy. The decision that we made to bring on observability platform, Monte Carlo specifically, really just helps us with that uh, strategic importance of trust, right, in our data. And um, you can score trust, you can measure it, but more than anything, it's a human emotion, right? So on top of all these kind of tactical ways that Monte Carlo helps us instill trust with our user community, more than anything, it just, we can tell our analyst community that we have a tool in our stack that is dedicated to this proposition, right? trust that that human emotion that I mentioned earlier, it's not necessarily always a 
say rational, right? But if you can give analysts access to a tool where they can see the health of all the data objects they're using, even if they've had, you know, a negative experience once with a particular table, without an observability tool, they may be just really allowed to kind of run with that assumption. But if you can put an observability tool right in front of them and sell them, hey, this table's really only had one incident, the one that you noticed in three years prior to that, it's been fine. That's actual data that you can show and, and, um, and back up those propositions against. So here's a quick architecture diagram. So uh, we've got uh, data sources coming from either self-hosted applications inside of our data centers, which there are a dwindling number, uh, many, many cloud applications and many, many just third-party SaaS products that we use. And those products, they'll send us data um, mostly in a batch format, but since we are an airline and we really, really need real-time data, there's streaming components in real-time feeds that we get from each um, most systems that we have at JetBlue. So ultimately, all of that um, goes through different pipeline tools. We use Fivetran for some systems, and then we use uh, Azure Data Factory for the majority of our data pipelines. All that data is then transformed by DBT, ends up in our Snowflake instance, which then goes further down line to Tableau for business intelligence use cases, as well as Databricks for AI and ML use cases. So we've got Monte Carlo sitting over that right half monitoring our data and keeping it healthy. So I want to talk a little bit about our use cases here. The most, the, I, I would say the strongest point of Monte Carlo and one of the first features that you'll start seeing is really a, a, a basic one, but a necessary one, freshness monitoring, which is essentially uh, monitoring the last time there was a, an attempted write operation to the table, right? And then volume, which is when those write operations happen um, how many roads were added or deleted. And this, uh, one of my favorite parts about Monte Carlo is that the setup of the tool is really, really minimal in terms of what's actually required from the customer, right? So we you sign an agreement with Monte Carlo, they um, activate the integration with Snowflake, for instance, it spends a few days learning the regular update patterns and cadence, and then right out the bat, you've got freshness and volume monitoring across all of your tables and views inside Snowflake. Um, and that's without us lifting a finger, right? So that 100% coverage that we get out of the box is really, really critical, even for basic things like freshness and volume monitoring, because if you're not actually loading data into your warehouse consistently, nobody can actually use it, right? It's a dead prop, essentially. It's not pictured on this screen, but again, some of our, our, my personal favorite features about um, the tool is that we'll get an incident IQ portion for each problem or anomaly that fires. And inside that incident IQ portion, it'll tell you the downline objects um, that are impacted because Monte Carlo does uh, track select lineage across uh, any integration that you have enabled for it, which is for us, Snowflake and Tableau. So any incident that fires automatically, you're going to know right away what's being impacted downline. On top of that, um, Monte Carlo scores what it calls your key assets, and that's based on essentially how many people are reading from that table and using it on a daily basis. So instantly you'll know if a particular table on a particular incident is impacted and how essentially um, how prevalent that impact is based on how often that asset is used, right? And then lastly, Monte Carlo also helps us understand who's querying different tables and your user population, how they're using it. So again, with any incident, instantly you're going to know on that same page how many people um, are being affected and, and particularly who's being affected, right? So that you can get notifications out to them immediately. It gets us out of this business of, hey, there's a problem with this table. We have to email this user group so that they know Monte Carlo can do that for us automatically so that the um, analyst that's using the table knows there's a problem as soon as the data team does. We can work on resolving it while they don't email their report to the CEO, right? Uh, while there's, whether the data is broken. So those are some of the out-of-the-box monitors that come with Monte Carlo, but they also have a second area of their platform around custom monitors. So I wanted to just pick three that we use really frequently here at JetBlue. Um, there are many more than this. SQL rules are um, essentially... Just you can run any SQL statement. They also give you um, maybe two dozen pre-baked options to pick from and then get a, an alert um, if anything does return um, in that SQL query. 
So think about this as a unit test sort of functionality here. Um, dimension tracking is where you take a low cardinality column and it monitors the distribution of the values in that column across the rest of the table. So this is really useful for certain types of calculated logic that we put in. Uh, lastly, field health monitors, um, these are an ML powered monitor. Essentially, you just pick a few fields on a table or all fields on a table from Monte Carlo to monitor, and then it's gonna kind of capture things like mean values and that alert you when there's deviance. Digging a little deeper on kind of some specific examples of those three monitors, we commonly use uh, SQL rules for checking that like a table is unique, for instance, or eventually we'd, what I'd really like to get to um, is a point where all of our engineers write their unit tests um, for a particular asset that they're getting ready to deploy so that that unit test um, not only gets tested when they're deploying it, but becomes a constant uh, check against that table to make sure that there's no problems and then also becomes a regression test when we make changes to those tables. And again, all this happens automatically. You just set this monitor and let it run. Another kind of interesting way that we use the SQL rule monitors is that we um, we have a technical writer um, on my team that documents the values for certain really marquee columns and marquee tables. So we can actually set a SQL rule to monitor the values that are coming across in those columns and alert us when something changes or there's a new value that's coming across that we haven't actually documented yet. So this is just a testament to the fact that you can use Monte Carlo for more things than just data quality problems, right? This is a documentation monitor for us. Dimension tracking monitors. Again, I mentioned that um, we use these in certain types of calculated logic, but also just really important data attributes. For instance, when you actually fly, the ticket that you flew on will go to essentially a used status, which allows any airline, ourselves included, to actually recognize that revenue because prior to that point, it's actually held in escrow. So we don't actually have the money. So this one really data, you know, one really kind of like niche data attribute, a ticket coupon going to a used status is really, really important for our revenue teams to monitor. So uh, we can keep track of the health of that field to make sure that they're actually accurately able to report on it. Interesting use case that we found for our field health monitors is to help track drift in our models. Not necessarily track, but alert us, right? So our models will write to a snowflake table, the drift since essentially the last entry that's been tracked. And then uh, Monte Carlo will monitor that field um, that they're writing to, constantly monitor for the mean value and alert us when there's a significant change. So we get an alert through that when our models have drifted. And with that, I'm going to hand it over to Ashley to talk about the day-to-day. -day. All right. Thanks, Brian. Before I get into this topic, I'm just super curious for folks in the audience, how many of you is your day-to-day -day job kind of like dealing with Snowflake, you know, monitoring or, or, or building new features? Okay. Out, for those of you who raised your hand, I'm curious, do you already have a data observability platform in place or maybe you're looking to potentially onboard one? Okay, I see a few heads nodding. So anyway, the reason why I want to talk about this and why this is so important is because no matter what data observability platform you choose, I mean, we went with Monte Carlo, but there are others on the market. You need to not only consider your platform, but also what are you going to do once you sign that contract and you actually deploy that platform on top of your your snowflake because getting the platform in place is 50 percent of the equation the other side is um, what are your teams going to do when they receive an alert how are they going to then act upon that information that the tool is generating it seems like common sense but honestly we didn't really think all that through <laughs> when we when we had our first uh conversations and our first deployment with monte carlo so uh if you can yeah let me take that that would be good all right so the first thing is why is an operational process important the analogy in the blue box is one of my favorites, which is an observability product without an operational process to back it is like having a phone line for 911 without any operators to receive or action the calls. How much would that suck? You call 911 and no one answers you and then you're stuck with a problem that you can't solve on your own. So as a engineering manager or someone whose responsibility it is to make sure that our data has the least amount of problems as possible, you need to make sure you've got people in place um, to receive those alerts, act on them accordingly, and escalate as needed, right? The three steps are super simplified here on the slide. 
but uh, it, it kind of walks through the logic that I just described. You, you, you get receive an alert, um, you review it, and then you have to figure out what action you need to take next to act upon it. Uh, going back to the analogy on the top, do you need to send an ambulance? Do you need to send a police vehicle, right? You need to figure out what is that next step that needs to be taken to resolve the problem, depending on where it's, it stems from. And the third step is probably the thing that takes the longest to do, right? Um, it, it, an engineer needs to look at the alert, understand what does it mean, understand where uh, in the pipeline could it have broken, and then figure out, okay, do I need to escalate to an internal um, engineer? Do I need to escalate to a third party that's maybe sending us data and they didn't send us the file today, right? So more specifically, broken down into three steps, which I don't know why they're la all labeled number one. I guess they're all super important. I just want to uh, explain more uh, technically how we actually do this. So we've got a, t a Teams channel. We use Microsoft Teams at JetBlue where all of our data engineers and also our data ops engineers are basically subscribing to the alerts that come through that channel. Super easy to set up in Monte Carlo. I think a lot of the other observability products also offer similar uh, capabilities. They also offer Slack. And if you're not on any of those, they offer email alerts too. But the point is you've got to have a common channel where you get all of these alerts um, to the people that actually need to review them. The second piece is having dedicated folks to monitor that channel 24-7 uh, or whatever your SLA requires, right? For us, um, it was our ops team, which was actually a pre-existing subset of data engineering for a long time. But their main priority before we brought on Monte Carlo was to just monitor pipeline runs. Like if something failed, okay, go into the pipelining tool, figure out why it failed and resolve it that way. But now they've got this extra level of insight, right? Because now they're actually able to see okay, there's something wrong in the table. Maybe the pipeline worked fine right? and everything looks healthy there, but the data in the table itself is no bueno. So um, they've got that tool in their, in their, in their toolbox now. Um, and the third one is something that I find to be super, super helpful. Um, we have twice weekly meetings with the ops team to go through all the incidents that occurred over the past you know, number of days since we last met. And this gives us the opportunity to see are there trends that are popping up that maybe we need to escalate to a third party or someone internal? Also, it gives um, the ops engineers the opportunity to discuss any like difficult things that they um, weren't necessarily able to resolve on their own or something that you need to talk through. So just to keep that visibility on the alerts, I would recommend having you know your your managers or whoever is tasked with really being responsible for. Um, the team who is uh, running the ops to just be aware of um, what's going on uh, in your observability tool. Measuring success. We love this, don't we? One of the things that uh, we've thought a lot on is how, what are those metrics or those KPIs that we want to track to be able to, you know, show our leadership? How, what is, what is Monte Carlo doing for us? What is the return on this additional observability that we've stood up. And these are just six metrics. I'm sure if you've gotten into the observability space yourself, you probably have your, your own list, but I found these to be super helpful for us. First one at the very top left, probably the most basic one, percent of incidents classified. So what this means is, you know, imagine you've got um, your observability platform that spits out, I don't know, 100 alerts over the course of a month. You want to ensure that you're able to label each of those incidents with some kind of indicator that tells you what is the status of it, right? Is it still something that's like unresolved after a month? Hopefully not. Is it something that was fixed immediately after it, it popped off? Okay, cool. Is it something that was expected, right? So maybe like one of your um, internal developers or your third party folks made a change and Monte Carlo then found that uh, you know additional column or maybe extra records added to a table that it didn't expect, that's fine. You classify that as expected um, because that really shouldn't be counted against you if, if someone comes and says, hey, like how reliable is your data? As long as you know and you communicate up front to your stakeholders that that's an expected change, then you're kind of in the clear there. The second one on the left, number of incidents overall, super simple one um, to calculate, but I do think it helps you to understand what portion of um, your data tables have been in some kind of an incident with respect to your overall data landscape, right? So Brian had this slide earlier uh, in the presentation. We've got, you know, several thousand tables that Monte Carlo is actively monitoring for us. 
And depending on the number of incidents, we can tell overall, like, where do we stand in terms of the health of our data when we compare number of incidents to overall tables. User engagement. So this one's a little bit outside of the realm of an observability tool out of the gate, but we do believe that it really indicates how much users trust your data if they are using it and you're seeing your engagement go up. I, I think about mobile apps, right? And if you've got an app on your phone that totally sucks, you're probably not going to use it. Um, so if, we, if you see your user engagement numbers going up over time, I mean, it doesn't say everything about the trust of your data, but I think it is a good indicator. Um, so the time to resolution, right? So this is an obviously an important part um, of what we want to track with Monte Carlo. When, incident, when an incident fires off, we want to know how long, um, if it is truly an incident, not something that's expected, we want to know how long um, it takes us to fix that. And then uh, this, uh, the next one, the number of incidents per data set, this is really useful to understand um, the health of a particular table or particular data set, right? So if you're just tracking the number of incidents overall, you're not necessarily getting a picture of what's actually problematic versus what just has a problem once every year, right? If you've got a particular data set that has a ton of alerts that are firing out of it, that means the engineering team needs to dedicate some tender love and care to that data set. And that, that last one on, this, on the page um, really just um, speaks to the, to the previous, right? We want to know percentage-wise, you know, think of a, a group by here, how many of our data sets, again, experience an incident maybe once per year versus once a week? which is hopefully never, <laughs> but um, it's, you know, things happen. Uh, so one of, the, one of the great aspects of Monte Carlo is that they have, a, they have a UI that will expose a lot of these metrics for you, allow you to drill in and understand these things, but also, because they were built on Snowflake themselves, um, they offer a Snowflake data share, right? So in that Snowflake data share, they put um, everything that's included in the UI plus a lot, lot more, and we subscribe to that share, we ingest it, and then uh, for, at least personally for us, um, we've built some Tableau reports um, off of the data and that share to just better understand how we're handling the tool. Thank you.